place to watch that. I know that Canyon, is Canyon still having fireworks this year? We don't know if they're having this year. This, last year, you know, of course, we've never seen Canyon Yeah. Last year, but we've been told that they're supposed to have a big deal this year. Okay. Because Amarillo gave up on them. They stopped for a while. Well, they, they started having them at the new ballpark. They, they've been having a little bit of fireworks. I don't know what they're doing this year. Well, Miss Sandy, Pastor Sandy. Did y'all enjoy that word last week from Pastor Sandy? Wouldn't she? That was just some really, really good word put together, uh, bringing out real truths, and she's going to continue with that message this week. So. Is, is back up? I went, and looked I, went I put it back up um, this morning. Okay. Yeah. I was going to edit it, and I hadn't had time to edit it, so it's just there raw. So what you get is what you get. I was going to take out all the places where I said, well, what about the PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. If you will go ahead and play the intro on that. Okay, he's not. <laughs> I wanted you to play the intro on YouTube. You set it up, did you not? I gotta do some work. All right. Here we go. So you will be happy. Oh, well, wait. All right. Welcome to Life of Worship. And we are so glad that you've joined us today. We are going to continue in the journey that we started last week when we were talking about what does it mean to be human? All right, something clicked. Something clicked, and I, my mic went dead. I'm not sure what that was. All right, so I thought we were starting right away. Let's try battery first. Is it? Hello? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. But we are going to continue with that journey. Last week we talked about what it was like to be human. What? Well, you need to go back and listen to the message. That's all I can talk tell you. It's called The Walking Dead. Are we the walking dead if we aren't human? Uh-huh. Are we the walking dead if we don't follow his word? Uh-huh. We actually are. So, and with that being said, I'm going to just do a short, short review because I want us to jump right in. I know I even had some questions over, what about Genesis chapter 3? We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it today. And I know you guys want to hear, you want to know, because guess what? If we want to walk in the fullness of who we are and, and fulfill every purpose for which we've been called, then we need to know y'all's word. Amen? All right. And what I said last week is Genesis always sets the stage for everything. So I want us to go back uh, and read Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28 one more time. So let's read Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, slides 2 and 3. And it says, I'll give you about a few seconds to get there. That's all you get is a few seconds. Uh, Genesis 21, 26 through 28. And it says, then Yah said, let us make man in our image. I'll do that again. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, real quick review. Again, you need to go back and listen to the detail in the message I did last week, The Walking Dead. It is up and so you can read, listen to it now. And it's, we've covered a couple words. We'll look at slides nine, I think. And it's... It, we color, covered Zalem and Demut. How many remember those words a little bit? And what those words are is the image and likeness. We are to be in the image and likeness of Yah. And it means to be human. 
to act like Yahweh acts and reflect his choices. Okay, do we act like Yahweh acts? Do we reflect his choices? And then we looked at the word male, slide nine, zakar, male. And what it means, zakar, is to bear the image. He bears the image of Yah, but he's called to remember. Zakar, to remember what God has said. And when we remember, is it just a thought or is it an action? It's an action. Therefore, we act accordingly that we believe him, that we remember him. Therefore, if you are male, it's bearing, it is bearing his image. It's the very same as remembering. We act like him. We act on behalf of Yah. That is to remember. And we, we've got to also understand that the man, the male remembers the commandments of God in his restored state. We need to be restored. And he keeps the word. He guards the word. And he keeps the commandments of Yahweh. And then, again, we looked at that in more detail. Slide four, being human. And it means, it means... To being human, act according to God's path in life. Stand against what? Chaos. Participate in the covenant. Know what is permitted. Know what is not permitted. And you act accordingly. I'm not going to get over that till we all get it. We need to act accordingly. So anytime you're acting contrary to his word, are you acting human? No. And then we looked at the word female, which is slide 13, and nekhova, nekhova. And it means pierced one, one who maintains boundaries. In Hebrew, the, the Hebrew words describe that function of a female. And because what is she? She's a supernatural boundary setter. She sets the boundaries. She is the protector of those boundaries. That's what a female does. And there's a lot more to all of those terms, but you need to go back and listen to last week's message. Now, what is that relationship between Zakar and Echava? Well, the male and female both receive the prime directive, which is what? Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. One is over the other. Both of them receive that equal, side by side. Okay? Inside the human, the man, meaning mankind. So no hierarchy. There's no hierarchy in this assignment. The male may be connected to the idea of remembering, as we said, the authority, the sovereignty of Yah, and, and acts accordingly, and the male and female work together, but they have different roles. They have different roles. Maybe... Maybe the male is connected to the connected to the female for a reason. Do you think? Do you think God put us in different roles, but had us share and walk together for a reason? Because one isn't complete without the other. We've got to understand we're not complete. We've got we have to have each other to fulfill that whole image of Yahweh. And then finally, we started to look at the the name as Isaac Connecto, which is help meet or Help or helper, however it's read in your word. That's slide 22. And the scripture in Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17. Let's turn there. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. All right. It says, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay. And then what happens after that? He immediately, we have Mrs. Adam that's given here. What does she do? She is the one that helps him guard and protects him. She is literally, the female is literally an A, a guard, a protector. And she is that help to Adam in a similar way that Yah is the help to us. Now, remember, we looked at the word Iser in Scripture, throughout Scripture, and over and over and over again, that word Iser was used for whom? Yahweh. So, is Yahweh the little helper? No. He's Yah. He's the one that helps us. He's the one that takes care of us. He's our healer, our deliverer, our strong tower. He is the magnificent one who, who took us from the pit of darkness and hell and raised us up. We bear his image. So 
we've got to understand that the female, when you look at the word, is the one who stands between Yahweh, Yahweh's command and Adam's obedience. She's supposed to be watching over Adam. She is the one that's that whose job is to make sure he doesn't go astray. I'm not saying he will on his own, but remember, the man is a fire that a fire that's ready to just burn and go do what he's supposed to do. And the female who bears that image in her body is that Brick does the boundaries and says, "Hey, let's make sure we're going down the right path." Again, go back and listen to last week's message. So we know in slide 29, a controlled at, burn, a controlled burn. Oh, I need to put that in my notes. That's really good. The female comes in to help the help. The I love that. A control burn. All right. So let's look at slide 29. Adam guards the garden and Hava guards Adam. I don't know. Maybe they want to look at the slides online. Um, if so, you're going to need to move the camera a little bit. But I don't know if it's going to be a choice. Me or, me or the slides. Let them tell you what they want to look at. I would want to look at the slides personally. But you know how that is. So what did I say? Adam guards what? And what is Mrs. Adam guard? Yeah. Wow. Adam came from the dust of the ground, the garden, and she came from him. Hmm. Let's put those together. Anyway, this, she brings this help, this help of reminding, this help of rescuing, of demonstrating. She, there's this demonstration of trust in she is the one that's there to help him. And we have lost that in our society because we brought down tradition after tradition after tradition and stuck the female under the thumb of everything. And it's happened in almost every religion and every culture. And that includes the culture here. I have heard so many times, well, a woman better not speak. We're going to talk about that next week. Let the women be silent. We're going to talk about that next week. We're not going there this week. But guys, we've got to understand that Yahweh gave the command to take dominion and to multiply, etc., etc., to Mr. and Mrs. Adam. So why does Yahweh say it's not good for man to be alone? Because there's no balance. There's no balance that if it takes two of us to make one, then just one, you're sort of you're sort of walking a little bit lopsided, aren't you? We've got to be balanced, and it takes both, the male and the female. In fact, we're going to look at that, slide 31, and that word alone is lavado, and the root is vad. So Rabbi Shlomo Riskin says it refers not only to be socially alone, but it's also an aloneness which penetrates the depths of very one's, one's very existence. I will tell you this. When you've lost a spouse, I can't tell you personally, but I've watched my mother. When you've lost that spouse for one reason or another, it's like half of you is gone. You have to relearn how to even see life and how to function within life because it's like half your body has been severed from you, which even brings into a bigger picture how important it is that the male and female complete each other with that one-to-one -one concept. They were one, they were separated, we came two, and to come together again as one. So that picture of that aloneness, which penetrates the depths of one's very existence. Guys, I know a lot of you here probably have experienced that or can experience that. And it's painful. And it's something I pray I never have to find out. But alone, lavado, by yourself, slide 32, the Hebrew text uses the verb hayah, and it says it's never good for man to be manifested by himself. So what does that exactly that mean? That full sense of what it means to be human is not fully revealed until what? Both are part. Male and female are one. It's not fully manifested in just one. You need the male and the female to be revealed. You need that. You need both of those things exhibited. You need... You need to remember that can a male reproduce by himself? Can a female reproduce by herself? It takes both the male and the female. If you don't have that, there's no harmony in the relation. There's no harmony. There's disharmony. And what are we supposed to do as Yah's people? We are supposed to push the chaos back. Amen? 
because we walk in his Torah. We are to be the light in the midst of darkness that caused darkness and chaos to subside. So we remember the male remembers. He's the one that remembers, and he's, but he still requires that boundary setter in order to bring proper order and, and bring that activity that goes forth in God's image. It takes two. It takes two. 33. The rabbis say that a man without a woman reduces the representation of the divine image on earth. What does that mean? It reduces the it reduces the representation of the divine image. Well, who is the divine image? It's Yahweh. Without the two together fulfilling their purposes, walking in Torah in the instruction of Yah with the fullness of the Spirit in Yeshua, then then what we see is Yah isn't being reflected around us. It takes both. Well, are you sure? Well, could Yah have easily just made another Adam? Another male, oh, another thing that looks female, or another, another male, meaning human, meaning man, woman, but still would that have been fulfilled? No, it wouldn't have, because it takes two that can be completely opposite, but yet we need that other half, amen? So the Hebrew says, as I said before, sees the action, and Adam alone is deeper than being by himself, because being alone is a representation of disorder. Yeah, man is manifest better as two, male and female. So I want us to look at the word connecto in slide 34. And it means suitable in part. But I want us to break it apart. And if you want to know where that's first seen is Genesis 2, 18 and Genesis 2, 20. But when we look at the word connecto, it's a, comp it's a compound of two prepositions, key and neged. Okay. Why do I say that? Because when we look at the depths of the Hebrew, we understand better what the role of the Iser Connecto is. Okay? So let's look at Leged. It can mean before or in front of or corresponding to or against or opposite. Did I just say against? Yep. I did. Hmm. What could that mean? Well, let's talk about it. And then we look at the word key, which usually means like or as. So when you put the Iser with this compound, it shows us that it's the help, the protector, the rescuer that opposes or is against. What the female is to oppose or come against at times, yes. Yes. How? Well, maybe it sounds contradictory to you, but it's not. I want us to think a little bit. Let's look at what Rabbi David Friedman says. He says, the Iser is strength and power, and the Connecto is one equal to him. I did say one equal to him. Slide 36. Rashi, Rashi says, if the man is worthy, then his wife will be a help, an Iser, a helper. And if he's unworthy, she will be against him. I'm going to read that again. If the man is worthy, then his wife will be a help. And if he's unworthy, she will be against it, against him for strife. Rabbi Walter Wurstberger says, Hava compliments Adam by offering opposing perspectives. And then Skip Moen, slide 37, says, The woman is the ultimate weapon against unrighteousness. Well, that's pretty powerful. Now, this is when we're walking in Torah. This is not when you're out in the world. This is not when you're doing your own thing. This is when you're walking with God and you're intimate with Him because neither male nor female can fulfill their role or their purpose when they're walking in their own agenda doing their own thing because our source is Yahweh, period. So if we are skewed and we are not connected to Him and we are not following His Word and we are not working out our salva salvation, quote-unquote, if we are not walking in the fullness of the Spirit, then we're going to see distorted roles from, it, from either of those. We can claim we're a believer, but if we're not acting on it and we're not close to Yahweh, then we can bring further damage to a, to a marriage or anything else. So when I'm talking about these roles, I'm talking about people who have given their lives to Yahweh, who are walking and acting it out actively in their lives. So... What does this mean here when we look at the eyes or connecto? It means that 
if Adam needs a helper, why does God need to create an opposite? Because we cannot partner with a lesser being than when we, a lesser being whom we subdue. How can you be a partner if I stick you under my thumb? Yeah, I'm here. You're my partner, but you better do everything I say when I say it. Is that a partner or is that a slave or a servant? I'm serious. Is that a partner? Is that an equal partner? So if you have one party in a business and you say, you bring somebody and you say, hey, we'll be partners. And then the other guy or girl manipulates it and takes control of everything and you get this little part. Are you equal partners any longer? What does marriage require? Equal partners. Equal partners. So when we look as it is Israel is an Izer, Yahweh helping it. We see Israel's Izer is Yahweh himself. And what's Yahweh doing? He is helping us in that same manner. Just as we read those scriptures last week. He is our Izer. Our Izer. So when we are walking uprightly, what is Yah for us? Things go really well. He's for us. He's actively fighting, fighting for us. He, our enemies are his enemies. His enemies are our enemies. But when he strays, does it not seem like he's against us? I didn't say he was, but sometimes it feels like that because we made a mess and now we're walking in the consequences of it. Because of his word, he has the standard and we go against it. It tells us in his word what happens when we don't follow. So it may seem like he's against us, but he wants us to walk uprightly. And it only seems like he's against us because he wants us to turn our life around. So he's let us go. He's let us go and face the consequences of our own behavior. Well, guess what? Just as Yahweh does that, so does the woman. What? Because when we look at Yah, his desire is when he's against us, he wants us to turn around back to repentance in that similar way, in that similar fashion that is God-ordained purpose of a woman. Sometimes she comes, she, sometimes you're side by side, but sometimes she's that opposing force. Say, come on, we need to look at the word together. A reminder, here's the boundary. Have you ever felt, it, for those of you that have been married or are married, has it ever seemed like there was an opposing force? Or maybe you were that opposing force? Not because you want to bring destruction. But if you are the one that's the boundary setter, women, and you are the one that's the protector, and you are the one that's walking to discernment. Now, remember, I said both everybody can walk in discernment, but we have that special thing the world calls women's intuition if we're walking uprightly. Sometimes, hey, I know I've told Pastor, I just don't feel right about that. So I don't feel anything. Well, I, said, well, I don't feel right about that. I don't think we should do it. Or, I don't think we should go. Something's wrong in my gut. Sometimes he listens and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> and I would, I, and he will be, a, he will testify to you the times that he hasn't. He's like, man, I should have listened. And that's not saying we're a work in progress. We're, oh, we're not there yet. Our role is challenged as women's because of, of Genesis chapter three, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But we have a job as females to follow his word. But we also have a job to make sure we're right with Yahweh so we know his word and we do set those boundaries and we work together with our husband who's that fire that's bringing that remembrance of Yahweh that's following the commands. That's And, and we are supposed to do that too. But we work together and that is when there's power. That is when there's power. I want to look at slides 38 and 39 and I want to read you something from Dr. Skip Mullen which is from the book Guardian Angel. This is, I'm just going to read you directly what he says. The text suggests that she is designed for the specific purpose of maintaining obedience between her man and God. She is his intercessor. Ladies, are you his intercessor? She is to guard his relationship with the Creator, support him when he embraces God's direction, and oppose him when he does not. She is the helper opposite in the area only where she needs additional attention, not work, not world-changing assignments, not dominion, not stewarding, but spiritual awareness and obedience. Without her, the man is at great risk and particularly vulnerable. Remember, we talked about, it's just interesting that the command to don't eat the fruit and, and Hava as a helper 
or an ICER, Connecto came right back to back for a reason. All right, so slide 40. The rabbis say that man without a woman reduces the representation of the divine image on earth. I said that before, but I want us to understand it takes both. If fulfilling our roles, walking in the fullness of the Torah, it's 41. Okay, design. Let's look a little bit about the design. I mentioned it briefly last week, but we're going to go look in a little bit more detail today. So, Mrs. Adam. How was she made? She was built, right? She was bana, built from the already existing man. So, if Hava follows the pattern of, of Adam, then what is her responsibility? Because Adam guards and protects the garden, and she guards and protects Adam, just as we just talked about earlier, because she is built from him. Now, I want to talk about the side versus the rib. Okay. So, Adam is formed, yet Sar. He is molded and he is shaped from the clay or the dust of the ground, the Adamah. And Hava is Bana. She's built. She's reformed. She's remade. She's separated out. But the material was already present. So she's a modified Adam. Okay? She's still made of the same stuff. 45. But this is why Adam exclaimed, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay? So... What we tend to forget is why Adam needed Hava, okay? Bear sheep, or Genesis 2, 21 through 22. And Yahweh caused man to fall into a deep state of unconsciousness, and he slept. And he took one of his, one of, one of his sides, or closed it up in the place where it had been with flesh. And Yahweh Elohim built the Zalah that he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So which rib did it take? Rib. Did I say rib? Well, that's the tradition is that it's a rib. Was it the top one, the middle one, the bottom one? Which side? What was it? Well, some rabbis say it was the other up, uppermost and some say it's the lowermost, but we're not going with that right now because Adam was not solely male. In fact, I want two people to come up, a male and a female, preferably married. Anybody will be my volunteer? Chris, Tina? All right, Jason and Christine. Okay, you might look at the camera. Okay. So I want you to stand right here. Side by side. Why don't you come, come by me, Jason, and you stand by him. I want you to get as close as you can. Okay. This is like, <laughs> this is like creation. This is Adam. This is man. And they walk together. Take one step together. Try. All right. See, they're walking together. <laughs> because they're one. Now, they, as man, as one being, were given the command. Be fruitful and multiply. Take dominion. Subdue the earth. They were given that. But then Yah said, Yahweh said, it's not good for man to be alone. Because he needed one in his image. So he put him to sleep. They're already there, and he separated them, and now they are two, right? But they come back together as husband and wife, and they are one again. But now the complement is there. Just as Yahweh is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he is one God, but manifests in different ways. They are now one again, and that's what we need. It wasn't a rib. Christine's position is not here. Get behind him. Get, make sure you're it. Is this Christine's position? No. No. Christine is equal to her husband. And they walk side by side to accomplish all that they to accomplish with Yahweh in the middle. Thank you. Okay? We've got to understand that it's not just about an agenda and a society and our tradition. Guys, it's time we throw away our tradition. Okay? It's time we throw it away. Okay. Now... I want to look at the word zelah, T-Z-E-L-A. It's used in other places in the Tanakh to mean side. What did I just say? That very same word, zelah, that, that people have translated as rib, 
is, is used elsewhere in the Tanakh as side. Is that important to know? Yes. Because we have this tendency, man has a tendency to do what he thinks is, is the best way to translate the scripture. Man gets in the way of what God's initial intentions were. And that means if we're Hebrew roots, etc., we still carry around our traditions, right? Okay, in Sharuma 2620, 26 through 27, Rambam, it says, side is the correct translation, not rib. Okay? The text also seems to support this because it, in the description of creating woman, is there a mention of a soul being infused or <sighs> being infused into Hava's body? No. Okay. But Adam, as the mankind, had to have that, right? Because they were too. There's no new breath of life that has to be breathed in to make her a living soul. Also, the omission in the second creation story suggests that woman was created from something that had already that already contained the breath of life. There was no new infusion that was needed. Okay, and the first creation story, the text shifts between singular and plural, and we discussed that last week. Singular and plural, over and over again, in reference to man and God. Okay, but both. Both the use of the plural and the blessing itself indicates that there's a female half and, a, and exist, a, existence at the same time as that male. Okay? So created, in the first story, it says the text uses created when detailing the making of men, va And in the second story, Hava is not created, ex nihilo, and thus the text refers to her as built. Okay. A final proof. At this point, for this point of view, it, that is nowhere in the else in the Tanakh is a law. It, nowhere. What did I just say? Nowhere else in the Tanakh is the law. It, it translated as rib. It's always side. So why do we do it as rib? Because it seems logical to us. Because man gets in the way. For this reason, let's look at verse twenty-three. For this reason. Man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Hmm. For this reason. Would it seem if the woman was subservient to the man that it would say, for this reason, man shall be joined to his wife and the woman leaves the father and mother? Is that what the scripture says? No, it actually says that man leaves his father and mother. Okay? The so, because woman was taken from man, it's necessary that one day he leaves his father and mother so that he can be joined to his eyes or connecto. He's got to be joined to her. Think about it for a moment. In our culture, there's always been this hierarchical position between man and woman. How many of you have come from a congregation in the past where male-female roles are not equal? There's no female pastors, no female anything, because females can't do that. How many of you have come from that? It, pretty much all of us have. And because we have carried around that tradition like a ball and chain that's weighed us down, so it literally skews our thinking and our seeing. We may see the walls to be this putty color that in reality, but because we've carried around our tradition, we see it as bright green or something because we can't see the truth because we're looking at everything through skewed vision and skewed eyes. It's time to stop so that we understand and we do take dominion and we subdue the earth and we are fruitful and multiply not only in offspring physically but in the offspring spiritually because we're working together. We're not fighting each other because we're all women. What women has been cast down if man doesn't understand the role and, and things are broken. Because we have walked in through the tradition of man and kept it with us. Because we have this tendency to keep through traditions we sort of like or are comfortable with. And if it's uncomfortable, if it seems completely, completely opposite what we should believe, then we don't want to touch it. I'll give you an example. For me, the first time I was really started to study or heard about that female aspect of Yahweh, I had tradition on me still. I'm I'm Seaver Roots. I was Miss Annie, but still there was a lot of tradition there. And I was like, male, female, and God, what, what? And in that that idea 
of that Holy Spirit, the Ruach, being feminine. And that's that feminine aspect of Yahweh. And that's why when we look at the word, at wisdom, in Proverbs, etc., that that is, that is the female. That is the Ruach. And that is who we are to be. I, I was completely offended. I said, no way. I can't, I can't go listen to that teacher because that's, that's just not right. Well, again, I tell you, when I hear things that <clears throat> are contrary to what I think they should be, I still go study it out. And I usually go, well, I was wrong. They're right. It is true. When, the, when you look at the word and you delve into the scripture, I've been wrong for however many years, <laughs> four decades. And uh, I, I got a correction to do. So I correct. But how many of us aren't willing to do that correction? Because it's uncomfortable. It goes against everything we've been taught for decades upon decades. <sighs> that hierarchical position. So, the question is, why does a man leave his father and mother to be joined with a, with a wife? Wouldn't it make more sense with our tradition that she leaves? Why does the serpent approach Mrs. Adam and not Mr. Adam? We talked about that last week. We're going to go to it in a little bit more detail. If Adam is Hava's protector, the serpent, the serpent should approach Adam. The protector get because you remove the protection. Remember, we talked about military last week. We said if you're about to attack an uh, attack a city or a mili something else in war, whatever. What, what are you going to do? You're going to take out the guard so that you can go after the the, the, the rest, right? You're going to take out those who are guarding, those who are in the position to let other people know, those who are in the position of protecting, so that you can go take your spoils. Okay, so if Adam was functioning as the role of the gatekeeper here, if he was functioning in that role in their relationship, then the serpent would have gone after him, but he wasn't. He wasn't. We've got to adjust our thinking. Adam was allowing Hava to function in her fullness as the protector in her God-given role. And the serpent came in and did what he did. It rubs against the grain, but that's the way it is because she is that boundary setter. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Huh. Well, we all know the word doesn't say you can't touch it. What did she do? She built a fence. Remember we talked about that fence setting last week. She built fences. She built a boundary. <laughs> you don't touch it, you're sure not going to eat it, are you? <laughs> that would be a supernatural thing, right, if that happened. But man-made law is designed to guard or protect someone from even coming close to breaking God's commandments. That's what the rabbis, that's what tradition has done in the Jewish tradition is they create fence upon fence upon fence upon fence. There's a commandment over there, and it becomes so burdensome that it's hard to walk in the fullness of your faith, in the fullness of the, the Torah, in the fullness of Yeshua, because we are so burdened down by fence after fence after fence. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Slide 46 and 47. The serpent said to the woman, you sure, surely will not die, for God knows that in that day you will eat it, eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband, and he ate it. Last week we discussed the reason, the possible reason for her temptation to go ahead and eat the, tree, eat the fruit. Now, did, does it say in Scripture that, have, that Mrs. Adam... Sinned intentionally? No. It says she was deceived. It said that Mr. Adam sinned intentionally. Or he sinned. Okay? And we said maybe it's possible that as he was beguiling her, he she thought she could fulfill her role as protector if she knew more. <gasps> my eyes will be open. If my eyes are open... Maybe I would do my job better. 
So she put that the enemy's word over, over God's word. That's what she did. And then Adam, consequently, put her over God. Sin is sin. Ignorance doesn't mean that you're free from the consequences of what you just did. With that being said, I want us to look at the curses. And I want us to pay real close attention here because this is where a lot of people get stuck in the role of male and female. So let's go ahead and go to slide 49 and we're going to read 49 and 50. And that is Genesis 3, 11 and 12 and 13. So turn to in your word to Genesis 3, 11, 12 and 13. When you're there, give me a hand clap. So I know. All right. I hear that popcorn again. It says, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Hmm. So we have a blame game going on here, don't we? How many of us like to blame somebody else for something we've done? Well, let me tell you what's a sign of maturity is when you say, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. I know that even Amariah now, I'm using those same things with her that I did as I raised my son. We raised our son. I always say it's better to face the consequences of what you did than to lie about it and then face the consequences of that and this. Because he learned, my son learned early on that to fess up, you probably would get some mercy if you fessed up, yeah, I did it, and I'm sorry, I repent. Then lie about it because you are going to get triple times the punishment for lying to me about doing it. Because let's face it, ladies, especially ladies, don't we already know? <laughs> How many of you ladies know your, your, your kid did something and you know it? In fact, I don't know how many times I'd say tell Pastor John, I'd say, I know this happened. I can't prove it right now, but I know it. I know it. In my knower, I know it. It's that thing again, that boundary, that protection, that guide in a role. And sure enough, it might be a year or two later, but I was right. <laughs> because we just have, we have that gifting, and men do too. But we knew, and, and the lie, the lie gets far more punishment than just saying, you know, I did it. I know if I get upset about something, and it'd be like, when, when John said, yeah, I messed up, I'm like, okay, that that helps. That helps me and that helps us. How many of you are better when it's just like somebody says, yeah, I messed up, I'm sorry. Ladies, does that not work for you? When Okay, I'm just going to give you a hint. I'm going to give you, because we are, you know, what does it say? What does that book say? Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Well, none of that's true, but you know what I mean. We are creative. We think differently. The man he does one thing at a time. And I was explaining a sermon once that I loved, and it said, man gets up on his donkey and he travels from point A and he's going to point B and if you interrupt him he's got to get back off his donkey look for that it get back up on it and go a different direction because they do one thing at a time that's the way they were made um, it's actually what I, I heard one message once that said it's sort of like brain damage because it's not literally brain damage okay because there's something that happens that in, in the utero where the man does begin to think differently. It's a biological, physical thing that happens. And women, everything affects us at all at the same time. A man, his dog died in the morning, he can go on and do it. He got fired later in the day, he can come home and, and continue with life as normal. Us, ladies, what do we do? If one of those, just one of those things happen, that's all we think about for the next five days. Am I right? And it hurt, and you're like, oh, what should I've done? Maybe I should have done this, and I did this, and oh, this is happening, and we, it, it affects us, it affects us completely. So in actuality, men function much better in in many areas because they are able to separate the things in life. Because we, as women, we take it all in, and it all happens, and it affects everything we're doing all at the same time. And men are like, okay, that's that. This is this. Come on, honey. Come on, honey. Let's. It's okay. Am I right? All right. So here we have, we're going to look at these curses and we're going to look at, at, we could look at what is actually being cursed here. Because 
we know that Adam and Eve sinned, and Yahweh asked Adam this rhetorical question, and Adam responds by blaming Hava, blaming Mrs. Adam, and he does it almost accusatory of Yahweh. Did you notice that in the language? What does it say? It says, the woman you gave me. Ooh, that woman you gave me, God. It's your fault. It's your fault, God. <laughs> and he's, he's not only showing his anger towards Mrs. Adam here, it almost seems in when you look at Scripture that he's angry with God for a moment. Have any of you ever been angry with Yahweh? Okay. I know he's 100% right all the time. And I also know he knows everything I'm feeling and everything I'm thinking. So sometimes when I want to throw my little pity party for myself for two or three minutes, I'll get up there, and this still happens sometimes, guys. This, I'm not far from this. This still goes on because he already knows what I'm thinking. So me to think that, that I'm thinking in private and he doesn't know what I'm thinking, you know what? So I just let it all out. I'm so angry with you, God. Why did you do this? And, how could this happen? And where were you? Your word says this and this and this. And then I, after I get through throwing my temper tantrum, it's like he starts to speak to me. Are you finished? Yeah. I know I was wrong. and I'm sorry, but it's just the way I feel. And he begins to talk to me and correct me and say, okay. Now, what do you preach, Sandy? Act it out. Stand on my word. Don't be moved by what you see and what you feel. Be moved by my word and who I am. Okay, you're right. I'm so sorry. So, we can't say, I can't believe Adam was angry with Yahweh. Because maybe I'm the only one. But I've been there. Now, I praise y'all. It's usually me acting out literally takes a few minutes and then I have my pity party for myself and it's over and it's done with and I've received the correction and I move on and that's what's really important is that we do admit when we're wrong and we move on it's better to say yeah I did it I did it but then we have Hava and Hava follows the same pattern because she's sitting there saying that serpent that serpent she admits her deception but she still blames now, do you find it interesting that the serpent is never questioned? Do you find it interesting that it doesn't even raise anybody's eyebrow that the serpent spoke? That's a whole other message for a whole other time. But that nobody ever goes, wow, there was a, a serpent talking? Hmm. Okay. Our times in the garden, I was, I was talking with someone... I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Tracy. I, I don't remember. Something recently. And I said, and maybe it was maybe it was Dina. If we actually used the 100% of our brains, what would, we, what would we be like? Was it you, Dina? Because we use a small percentage of our brain, and society and the world has changed so much. We are so far from our original state of creation. But that's what y'all wants us to return to. He wants us to be made whole and walk in that. And so, consequently, maybe another time we'll talk about the serpent speaking um, when we have time. But uh, again, we're looking at this blame game, and the serpent is never questioned. So let's look at slide 51 and 52. I want us to look at what the response was by everyone who was speaking. The serpent said, Genesis 3, 14 through 15, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every, every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Next slide. And I want us to look at Genesis 3.16. This is the curse of the woman. To the woman, he said, to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, conception. In pain, you will bring forth children, and your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Okay? Now, I want us to look at Adam, 44, 45. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. 
In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from, from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I want you to understand those scriptures that I read was either Adam or Mrs. Adam, Adam or Hava, were either of them cursed? No. Yahweh did not put a curse on either, either of them. He cursed the consequence of their sin. He cursed their roles in their purposes. Okay, this is really important that you understand this. The serpent was cursed, but Mr. and Mrs. Adam, their purpose was cursed. Okay, Adam comes from the ground. Adama, okay? We understand that. What is cursed here? Let's go back and read that. It says, cursed is the ground. Did it say cursed is Adam? So, Adam comes from the ground, and the ground is cursed. So, when he was working the garden before, did he, did he sweat and toil, or was it effortless to bring forth fruit? It was effortless. Fruit came because... Where he walked, there was blessing. He was in the garden. And now it's going to be hard to make things work and to make the living and to work the ground. Thorns and thistles would be everywhere. But what did his job change? Is he still supposed to work the ground? Yeah. Absolutely. So his job remains the same. It's just harder because it wasn't going to willingly relent the fruit. Okay, understand that. Because Mrs. Adam has the very similar consequence to this. Hava comes from Adam. Let's look at the pain of childbearing first. Okay. What was once natural and easy is now going to be painful. Okay. She's going to conceive and she's going to bear kids. And the Hebrew term also implies there would be great worry. How many of you have worried over your children and your grandchildren? <sighs> I don't even think I need to go there right now because as a mother, I think that is probably one of the number one things that gets my heart and can rip it apart is something happening to my kids or grandkids. I mean, even now, it can move me to tears in a moment just thinking of how you, you fight and you intercede for your husband, but your children especially. Am I right? Okay, so here we have this great worry in the Hebrew, this term, what mother doesn't have that concern? Well, then let's look at this other side. Hava's desire will be for Adam. Okay. In the second statement, Mrs. Adam it says has this desire. And it's some people say, well, it's a sexual desire. Folks, it's not a sexual desire. <laughs> if you're even going there, don't. I many men could say, is there always is that an issue? <laughs> I don't. That's constantly that she is on overdrive. In fact, many men probably would say, "Please, <laughs> right?" <laughs> okay, but that that's not. That's just another tradition. But others use that verse that say, "See, she wants to. She shall be ruled over. She wants to do it, but she's going to be ruled over now." And that's not what this means. In fact, that's very misogynistic to even think about this because that to think that it's sexual or something else, that's, that's just so far from what Yah means by this. Because the Hebrew word, word here in slide 59 is actually teshuka, T-E-S-H-U-K-A-H. And it is only used three in three passages in the entire Bible. This word teshuka, desire. Teshuka, desire. And that is Genesis 3.16, Genesis 4.7, and the Song of Solomon 7.10. Now, I want us to look at Genesis 4, 6 through 7, so we can look at this word desire again. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Okay, so here Yah is telling Cain that this that sin is is teshuka, that it's an unquenchable desire for him, that this sin, the enemy wants to come in and, and, and take him. But he's supposed to rule over 
He's supposed to rule over it still. That desire is there, but he rules over it. So when we look at the structure, it's it's the same. It's the same judgment placed on Hava after she's sinned. Hava has the same desire for Adam as sin has for mankind. It, it's, it's powerful. She wants to do what she's supposed to do. But here's the deal. Yahweh says if Cain chooses to do well, then everything is good. What is good? He's going to live safely in the house. But if not, he's going to, he, just outside the door, sin is like a lion ready to pounce, its sword, so to speak. So when we look at this phrase, and your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, is Yahweh telling Adam that he must rule over Hava? Let me ask you, who is Yahweh speaking to right there? Is he talking to Adam? No. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Mrs. Adam. He's not saying, Adam, rule over her. It's not what it says. It's what people like it to say, but that's not what it says. Because... Men have interpreted it so men can control women, and that's just the way it's been, and we're supposed to walk as partners. But Yahweh wasn't talking to Adam. He was talking to Mrs. Adam, and the result of her fallen nature the, is, is distortion of her original design. Remember, Miss Adam, what he, he, his job didn't change. So do you think Hava's job changed? No. Her job is still to protect her job is still to guard. Her, her job is still to set boundaries. Her job is still to oppose when things aren't right. Adam's job is still the same. So is hers. But what has changed? Did, does the ground willingly relent its fruit? No. And neither will Adam anymore. Unless he has been redeemed. He's not going to let Hava willingly do her role. Unless he's walking in the fullness of Yah. In the fullness of Torah. That is what this word means. Her desire is to do what, to continue to do what she's called to do. But the ground, Adam, won't easily give way. Adam's desire is still to work the ground and do what he's called to do. But the ground doesn't easily give way. The curse is on in that aspect in their lives. It's not on them. We've twisted it and made it seem like that Hava's role has completely shifted. And nowhere in scripture does that say that. She was designed to be the eyes of Konegdo. She was designed to fulfill that role. And she is still supposed to fill that role. Just as Adam's desire is to guard and protect that ground, to the earth, and in all creation. Is there a punishment for desire? No. There's no punishment here. Just as the ground won't give way, it, neither will man easily give way. So, neither will man easily give way to Hava's role as the Izer. Because she messed up. She failed in her role. She did not guard as she should have guarded. She didn't. So, then trust her. Unless we've been walking in the fullness of Yah. Because the fullness of Yah says the curse has been broken because of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen? In fact, I believe that we have been redeemed just as we've been saved. Just as we can be healed. Just as we can be delivered. The curse has been broken. So we shouldn't have to walk around and think that we're bound to those things that were happening in the garden. We're supposed to, we are supposed to become more and more and more like Him. And that means we have role has never, ever changed. We still subdue and, and take dominion. We still walk in the fullness of who he is, but we forget that because we think that we have been broken and messed up and we are far less than what he created us to be. No, we are a work in progress, yes, but our roles are the same. Our roles are the same. There's not an hierarchy. The two rule together at one time, and each perfectly fulfilled their roles. And now there seems to be an art hierarchy and added in the seat of power, but that's not the way God created it. And that's not the way, if we call ourselves believers, people of faith, that we follow the word that we should act as husband and wife. 
And when we bring that to the table, we are putting askew what God actually wants for our family and our life. And we are literally putting an obstacle in the way so that our family can't function and neither can our purpose function correctly because we have seen one side subservient to the other. It doesn't work that way because Yah is a Yah restoration. Teshuka, desire, is about, uh, about Hava wants to do what she's supposed to do. But because we've been redeemed, because when we walk in a household of faith, she can do what she's supposed to do. Amen. So I want to look at one more thing before we close today. And I want to look at 1 Corinthians 11.3. 1 Corinthians 11.3. And it says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and man is the head of a woman and God is the head of, of Messiah. Okay, there's another scripture. See, see, it says man rules over her in Genesis and here it says man is the head of the woman. Okay, let's look at this a little bit cl more closely. <sighs> because there's been a lot of confusion. There's been a lot of misapplication and persecution that comes from this verse. I preached a on a broader thing on this, on which master do you serve? I believe it's, you can look up, look it up on our YouTube channel on from May 16, 2020. And I have a lot bigger picture of what I'm about to talk now. So I go into it in a lot more detail. So I'm going to briefly go over this with you because head, that word head of the head of the woman, what does it actually mean? Well, again, does Paul think Greek? Paul is not Greek, nor does he think Greek at all. So it's impossible to apply Greek categories to what, what Paul, who is, knows the word, who was a, following the way, he followed the scripture, he followed the Torah, and you, can't, you cannot put our so-called New Testament ideas and tradition upon this word either, because his... Paul's entire conceptualization of relationship between man and woman is anchored in what? It's anchored in the Torah. It's anchor, anchored, anchored in scripture, not philosophy and not tradition. So did Paul, did Shaul follow the Torah, follow the instruction of God? Absolutely he did. Those are the words he used and those were the words he knew and that's what how he lived his life. So with that being said, Let's look at this word because we have to first read it. We have to read it as Paul would have read it. And the word is kafel, or actually I'll say it correctly, kafale. Slide 64, kafale. And it does say head, but what does it mean? In what sense does it mean like you're the head of the military, you're the head of the government, you are the, the head of the headwaters, how is this word actually used? Well, I want to look at what Gilbert Beliskin has analyzed. He says, every instance of the Greek word kaphale in ancient, in ancient Greek, Greek literature, every instance of this word that he's analyzed, he seems to, there seems to be no instance in the profane Greek literature where a ruler or iarch is referred to as a head as this word, with word kephale. Okay, so that means that our understanding of head meaning rule or authority over must be askew, mustn't it? If it's not used anywhere else like that, why would it be used right here? Well, we will see over and over that when it comes to the role of women, we see that happen, the mistranslation over and over again. Was it done by accident? I don't think so. No, I believe it was not. So there's no instance where it is used in this way. There's a whole bunch of other words that are used for authority. But in but Kafale only a few times. He also says there's only three cases of 180 where the Septuagint clearly uses Kafale for authority. Only three cases out of 180. So what is the probability that this word means authority like rule? Man shall not man is the head of the woman. Rule of a woman, the authority over a woman. Okay, so probably not. Would you not say that it, we have to look at the whole of Scripture? And I only have a little bit longer, guys, only a little bit longer. So let's look at the word kephale. We find kephale is most often used as source, not authority. Okay, does this change things? Man is the source 
of the woman. Does this make sense when it says in the word that Messiah is the head of every man? So Messiah is the ruler over every man, okay? And then it says that God is the ruler or authority over Messiah. That doesn't make sense because, first off, Yah gave all authority to the Son, and secondly, the Son and the Father are one. So does it make sense that God says, I will rule over you, even though I says that all authority is given to the Son? Does that make any sense whatsoever? Come on, guys. I need you talking back to me a little bit. Because the Father says, it says, the Father has put all things under the authority of the Son. So if you use this word as ruler or authority over, does it make sense? Because then that means God is the authority over Yeshua. Or does it make more sense? Does it make more sense to say that not an hierarchy of authority, but that but that 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 word source kafale when it's said like this, the source of the new man is our Messiah. The source of the incarnate Messiah is the Father. And the source where she comes from is the man. Does that make more sense than God ruling over Yeshua? Come on, guys. Tell me what you think no, here. That's right. It makes a lot more sense to see the word as source as it's interpreted in other areas of Scripture. So, when it says I, that to understand that Messiah is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ, listen to it if it's interpret if it's translated this way. But I want you to understand that Messiah is the source of every man. And the man is the source of the woman. And Yahweh is the source of Messiah. Okay, did that not just change your thinking? Do you see how this agenda to change the enemy's agenda? It's the enemy's agenda to change the way we think and function can completely ruin lives and can completely ruin ministries, can completely ruin and cause us not to fulfill the purposes for which he's called us. And society has taken hold of it and carried the tradition because the enemy wants to pull the wool over our eyes, so to speak. He wants us to walk around in confusion. He wants us not to understand so that it creates friction and conflict so that we become impotent in our walk as husband and wife, in our marriage, in our home, and that we raise generations just the same. Adam is the chronological source of the woman because she was taken out of man. And Yahweh is the chronological source of Messiah in the fullness of time. Yeshua is the chronological source of all mankind. In Him, all things were created. So what's the bottom line? You cannot use this verse to justify the authority of men over women. You cannot do it. You can't. Because that's rooted in Greek philosophy. That's rooted in misogyny. That's not in Scripture. That's not what it says. We were created together side by side. Equal. No hierarchy. And that has not changed. Now I want you to understand something else. We cannot serve two masters. If you look at this the other way, where it is more like authority over, I want to ask you something. If you're a man cannot serve two masters, how can women serve two authorities? I serve you man, but not God. It says man cannot have two masters. When I say man, it's male, female, it's mankind. Ladies, you have one master. Sha. Men, you have one master, it's Yah. And that, that's the bottom line. One master. A woman cannot be in subjection to her husband and also be in subjection to Yah. It's just not going to work. Chris. That term is, uh, it's, it's, 
Um, he, he asked, what about Abraham and Sarah? When you're looking at that, it's not talking about master over. It's, it, it's when she says master, it's, it's a respect. It's sir. It's, it's not in the same context. Um, did you have something you wanted to say about that? No, it's just respect. Pastor John says we've got to see that when she's saying master, it's, it's a respectful term in that language. Okay. What would you say? Well, we've got to remember we're to submit to one another, too. Very, very good. So in this aspect, would Yah require a wife to worship her husband because of I serve? Those words when you come together, never. We have one source we worship. What would you say? Well, we are all supposed to be one. We're supposed to be the body and he is the head. Yeah. So I've covered some ground today. Did y'all get some things from this? Did we learn anything? Okay, this is, I have one more part that we're not done yet. And I want, we, we would not, we would be doing disservice if we did not cover some more scripture from Paul that says, you know, a woman cannot have authority over a man and some things like that. And maybe we'll cover that next week. But guys, if we truly understand who we're supposed to be, don't you think we'll better fulfill the roles we've been called to do? Is it hard to get rid of tradition? Yeah. You have to change your thought, but we've done it before. And you know what? I'm ready if God wants me to change something else. I, for those of you that have been around, I will do it. I may say one thing, but if y'all shows me something else, I'll humbly say, hey man, I was wrong. Because the bottom line is, I just want to do what I'm supposed to do, what he's called me to do, what he's called me to be. I want us to be what we've called us, what he's called us to be, because we work together. And I, we work, and we, all of us work together as the body of Messiah. If we get a picture of what our identity truly is, that is when Hasatan's kingdom is threatened. But he's not threatened when we're limping along because our identity roles have been skewed by tradition. Do you understand that? He, we're not a threat to him when we don't walk out who we're supposed to be. In fact, he goes, yeah, you're partnering with me. You're partnering with me to create confusion, to create clashes, to create chaos instead of subduing chaos and walking as human. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that it brings forth life and that more abundantly. I thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity to gather in your house, both physically and online, Father, that we can study together, that we can worship together, that we can learn together, that iron sharpens iron and we learn from one another. Father, I thank you that you are bringing forth and you are breaking forth tradition and understandings of the way we've carried that have, that have skewed our roles as male and female, as humankind. Father, I thank you that you're bringing your truth to the forefront and you're causing us to remember your truth and not our tradition. Father, I pray that we that you help each and every person to rip aside the tradition, that false tradition that's been carried with them through decades of life. Father, that we can pull it aside and walk full in the fullness of what you called us to be, in the fullness of what your word calls us to be and our roles that you've called us to do. Father, please forgive us where we carried the tradition with us and made it our made it our way of life, or we we've lorded over one or another, Father, because we have not been walking in covenant. Father, let us walk together as male and female, husband and wife, Father, and if we're single, Father, as our role there, for you are still the husband to the husbandless and the father to the fatherless. Father, I thank you, Father, for your word that it brings forth life. And Father, we say, Father, the curse has been broken, so let us walk in the fullness of that. Father, let your word bring forth life. Father, let us be a people that takes dominion, Father, and doesn't retreat. Father, let us be a people that walk side by side. Because there's power and strength in that, Father, with you as our source and our center. 
Oh, Father, our desire is to not let the enemy continue to take ground, but it is time we as your people begin to take the ground the enemy has stolen. You will not have our children. You will not have our grandchildren. You will not have our purpose. But we will walk out your truth. Father, let us be a light. Let us walk and dispel chaos and darkness wherever we go. Oh, Father, let us as husbands and wives and, and singles, Father, and widows, let us walk in the fullness of you and understand that. Where our mind needs change, Father, we're willing to change it. Let us be willing vessels so that we look more like you. We give you this word. Let it bring forth life in our homes, in our communities, in our congregation. And Father, continue to minister to us, through us, and in us. We give you all honor and glory and praise in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.